And so instead of trying to avoid pain and, you know, instead of um, uh, trying to, to mitigate it, I instead focus on the pain and try to really understand what the pain is all about. I mean, Hello guys, I'm your host Antonio Colmenares and this is the Rebound Talks podcast where you find the best tools, tips, and techniques needed to overcome any adversity. This quote perfectly describes what we're going to be talking about today. When you think about pain and you think about misery, it's all in the mind. That's from Dean Carnassus, and Time Magazine has named him one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. Men's Fitness hailed him as one of the fittest men on the planet. He's an internationally recognized athlete and New York Times bestselling author. And among his many accomplishments, he has run 350 continuous miles for going sleep for three nights. He's run across Death Valley in 120 degrees temperature. And he's run a marathon to the South Pole in negative 40 degrees. Today we're going to be talking about finding your passion, changing your relationship with pain, and also Dean mentioned some insane stories about his runs, like his out-of-body experience. Stay tuned. Hello, Dean. How's it going? Hi, Antonio. How are you, brother? Th thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you uh, reaching out. And I, I want to start with your childhood. Following what you could call the American recipe for success, going to a great high school, then to a great college, to a, a for, working in a Fortune 500 company, becoming a millionaire, and then having the courage to pursue your passion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the course of my life. And uh, I've always been adventurous. And, you know, when I kind of fell into the mode of uh, corporate living, you know, corporate life and, you know, uh, getting a paycheck and kind of having routine. I felt like I was dying. Like, um, I hate routine. I hate doing the same thing two days in a row. And it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't conducive to who I was as a person. So I have to be honest, you know, resigning from my corporate job was terrifying. Uh, but it's much more commonplace now. I mean, you know, I did this, I don't want to say how old I am, but I did this a couple decades ago. Uh, nowadays, you know, the gig economy is, is strong. So there are a lot of opportunities to kind of follow your own path. But back mm -hmm. when I did it, you, you, you know, people didn't do things like this. You know, if you got a, if you got a, a, you know, an executive job with a corporate 500 company, you know, you were pretty much set for life. And I, I just didn't, you know, it, it wasn't doing it for me. And I think this is why you have inspired so many people. Because so many people wish that they could just leave their jobs, run away from their jobs and pursue their passions. But they're always very fearful. Fear is, um, I, you know, and I respect that. I, I was fearful as well. But, you know, fear is a, it's, it's handcuffs. Um, you know, fear is terrifying and it, it, and it, it stops a lot of people. Um, the other thing I would say is that, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not failure that, that stops people. It's the fear of failure. So hmm. I always encourage people to fail, like go do something that is intense, like sign up for a marathon and say, you know, you want to run the marathon in under three hours. I can almost guarantee to you, you'll fail, but hmm. it's great because you'll learn a lot from it. So, uh, getting used to failing and getting back up and continuing on is really an important skill. And it's, it's not, you know, like I said, it's not failure that stops people. It's the fear of failure. And diving a little bit deeper in this fear of failure, I not only think it's that, but pursuing the money route is something that's very prominent among uh, at least my peers, my college students, where, for example, I have a friend. I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago, and he told me about this internship with, that he was doing at this bank. He said that he was feeling overworked, that he felt miserable, but that he didn't mind keeping his head down and working till his 40s so he could eventually become a millionaire. You that you have seen both sides, the corporate route and then following your passion and doing very great as well. What could you tell college students that want to solely focus on the money? 
Well, you know, I do a lot of talks at colleges and I inevitably afterward I have, you know, kids come up to me and they say, uh, you know, where, where's the next opportunity? I mean, a, you know, AI is, is, is hot right now. What about nanotechnology? You know, wh where do I go with my career? And I, you know, I tell them, you, you, you know, don't look outward at, at what industry is, 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 you know, is, is the next opportunity. Uh, look inward to your heart and say, you know, who am I? And if I could get up tomorrow morning and be living the life that I would want to live, what would that look like? So a lot of people think when I say that to them, they're like, oh, I'd be drinking Mai Tais in, you know, on the beach in Tahiti. But when they think <laughs> about it, they think that would not, you know, that'd be great for about a week, maybe a month, but it wouldn't be very fulfilling as, as a life. So when they reevaluate, like, you know, what they'd want to be doing, maybe it's working for a nonprofit. You know, maybe it's, um, it's doing something like designing, you know, uh, uh, surfboards, whatever it might be, wherever your passion is, uh, that's the that's the career path you have to follow. And what advice would you give to someone that's struggling to find their passion? I, I'm curious as to how you found out that uh, running was your life's purpose. I think you need to experiment a lot and you need to try a lot of things. Uh, I work with this great company called The North Face, and, and their motto mm -hmm. is never stop exploring. So I think the more things you're exposed to and the more things you try, uh, the more you learn what you like and what you don't like, your preferences and the things you're not drawn to. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of kids say, well, I don't know what I want to do. Try a lot of stuff. <laughs> You'll find <laughs> out quickly, you know, what you like and what you don't like. I mean, look, even just looking at your major, I mean, did you choose your major because it was an area of interest to you or is because you thought there'd be, you know, a good career path in the future. And that's a, a good place to look, you know, how did, how did you go about choosing your major? Yeah, definitely. And w what if they just chose a very general major because they don't know what to do? How was your story? How did you dive deep inside you that after becoming a millionaire and having everything so comfortable, you decided that that was not the life for you. Yeah, I decided I like discomfort and that's just who I am. I mean, I like, uh, you know, being faced with adversity, um, sometimes failing and sometimes succeeding. But I really like those intense moments of life where, you know, everything is on the line. And when you're running an ultra marathon, you know, when you're running 50, 100, sometimes further uh, miles, you know, hundreds of kilometers, uh, you know, you're faced with adversity and there are there are reckonings you have along the way. You know, can you get through this? Um, you know, what are you made of? You're really looking inside and saying, do you have the grit? Do you have the strength and the resolve to keep going? And I was just drawn to that and I made a career of it. Yeah, what, what I admire from you the most is that no matter how much pain you're in and no matter how tired you are, you still keep on going. I read in a, in your book that you had an out of body experience where you literally saw yourself running from above and you still kept running after <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that was amazing. I was, so, I mean, just so you, the audience realizes I was, you know, I was running for three days without sleep. So uh, I ran, you know, 350 miles continuous and you're right. There was a moment where I, I was looking down at, at, it. at first I thought it was, it was some sort of bug on the ground. Like I'm looking at a, a bug scurrying along and, and then I tuned in further and further and I looked and I thought that that's, that's me, that's me down there running. It was, it was, it was as though I was in a helicopter or a hot air balloon and it was pretty trippy. Yeah. And what's the thing, what's the thing that's impacted you the most from running such long distances? You know, learning that uh, you can keep going when things are horrible. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, we're talking at a very strange moment in history, certainly something that you and I have never experienced before, and probably we will never experience again the rest of our life. So we're in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. And I, there are times where you think, how, how am I going to get beyond this? I mean, we've, you know, we've been in shelter in place here in San Francisco for three weeks and we've got another month where we're not supposed to leave the house. That seems impossible, doesn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. how, how does a human live like that? Uh, but 
once you do live like that, and once you get through it, you learn how strong you are and you learn about your resolve. So, uh, you know, signing up for an ultra marathon is just basically putting you in this situation willingly to see how you respond. Hmm. And I know Phidippides, the Asian Greek messenger, is somebody who you admire a lot. Can you tell us a little bit about who he is and why were his runs so important for the future of democracy? Yeah, so you've got to turn back the clock to ancient uh, Greece, to ancient Athens. And, um, you know, the Greeks were the first to come up with this idea of uh, democracy or, or uh, rule by the people, the polis. Before that, it was always uh, some sort of dictatorship or, you know, top down sort of um, oligarchy. And the Greeks thought, no, let's, the people should be ruling, not the leaders should be ruling the people. And what happened in uh, 490 BC is that the Persians uh, invaded Greece and they were going to conquer Greece. But um, the Greeks, you know, they wanted to keep this democracy alive. So they sent this ancient runner, Phidipides or Phidipides, to run from Athens to a city state called Sparta. So if you've ever seen the movie 300, have you ever seen the movie 300? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Sparta. So you know the most. <laughs> Badass fighting force in ancient Greece was Sparta. So he ran 150, 153 miles, basically, to Sparta to recruit the Spartans into battle against the Persians. And then he ran back to uh, the place where the Persians had invaded, which was called the Bay of Marathon. Uh, and they fought the, the battle and the Greeks won somehow. And then his final run was from the Bay of Marathon to the Acropolis to tell the Greek leaders that the Greeks had won. And when he got to the Acropolis, he said, uh, Niki, Niki, or Nike, Nike, which means victory, victory. You know, we are victorious. And, and then he fell over and died. <laughs> so hmm. it was very, it was a hero's death that he, uh, that he suffered. But, um, you know, that forever changed the course of human history, that run. And also, that's where Nike got their um, their corporate name. A lot of people don't realize <laughs> wow. that. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. And do you ever fear? It's incredible everything that he ran. He ran how long? Like from Athens uh, to Sparta, then from Sparta, did he go back to Athens and he then ran, to the Battle of Marathon? He certainly did. I read a lot about this in my, my latest book called The Road to Sparta. So it kind of explains exactly what he did. But you're right. That's exactly what he did. And you got to remember that this is a guy that's, you know, running probably barefoot um, hmm. as well as he's self-navigating. So, you know, nowadays, you know, when you go on a run, the course is marked, you know, you, you're, there's ribbons or there's um, flashing lights. So you know how to follow the path. I mean, he's doing all this by himself. He's carrying all his own food. I mean, nowadays, you know, when you do an ultra marathon, you wear a hydration pack or there are aid stations set up along the way. Uh, or you have a crew that brings you food, you know, he's out there by himself running for, for three days uh, through ancient Greece. And what, you know, that accomplishment is just phenomenal, what, what he did. And to think that it's almost impossible for a modern human to do what he did. And he did it, you know, 2,500 years ago. Uh, it's really, it's incredible. And, it, and that run, like we discussed, preserved democracy. And he ran for three days straight. And I know that you use his specific diet to try to recreate what he did. Do you think that you've ran further than, further than him or that he's ran further than you? Well, what does, um, I know that you have the current world record for 350 miles, 80 hours and 44 minutes. So uh, do you think Phidippides might have beat that or? I, I, I give him credit for beating me no matter what he did, because, again, you know, I have modern uh, shoes on. I have, you know, very sophisticated clothing that uh, is moisture wicking. So it's made for running. You know, he was running in basically a modified toga. Uh, he was eating figs. You know, he was eating olives. He had there was no, you know, Gatorade or there's no electrolyte replacement beverage. He was drinking water that he could find along the way so as far as hmm. you know his accomplishments versus my accomplishment i i say that he is way beyond what i did well that that's incredible to think because 
you you've ran for so long and you even fall asleep while you're running and you keep on going i don't know how that works <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh when you pull an all-nighter when you're cramming for a final or a midterm you know when you're kind of reading uh, and you you end up with your your head just kind of bobbing it's the same thing when you're running you're just running along and you fall asleep and then you wake up and you realize i've been running I, I just was asleep and i was running so your body pretty much just shuts down on its own <laughs> wow and when do you think this obsession for the complete control of the mind that the body started with you i think it started when i was a young boy i remember uh being a very young boy like four or five years old and sitting, believe it or not, in church. So I'm I'm 100% Greek and we went to a Greek Orthodox church and these sermons were really long. I mean, they were three or four hour sermons. And I remember wow. just fighting it as a, I just want to go crazy, you know, sitting there for that long, listening to uh, this, this, you know, this person talking for so many hours and watching people around me, like men and women, you know, grown men just, falling asleep and falling down <laughs> and this priest would just go on and on. I just remember thinking, just don't move, stay there, listen. Uh, and it was kind of like that discipline. Uh, it translated into running. Wow. And how do you think that a regular guy like me that goes running every once in a while or a regular college student can build this discipline over the mind and this control over the body? You know, I think most people view running as, as something miserable <laughs> that you want to try to avoid, right? It, you know, someone said to me, Does, doesn't running hurt? And I said, it, it does if you're doing it right. So, <laughs> you know, running is very painful and it's uh, people like avoiding pain. But to a certain uh, mindset, uh, to a certain individual, they want to welcome pain. They want to say, you know, can I tolerate this pain? Uh, can, I, can I overcome this barrier? Um, you know, most of the barriers are mental barriers. Uh, and, you know, running a marathon, for instance, is is something that will change your life. I tell I tell people this all the time. If you know, if you want to change your life, sign up for a marathon and in 26.2 miles or 42 kilometers, you'll be a different person. And there's this quote that you say that really stuck with me, that is. If you want to run, run a mile. If you want to experience a different life, run a marathon. And if you want to talk to God, run an ultra. What did you mean by that last <laughs> one? <laughs> I think there's a point where, uh, you know, you're, you're speaking to a higher authority when you're running an ultra marathon. That's what it comes down to to me. I mean, you're, you're, you're out of your physical body. And your your mind and everything is someplace else. And to keep going, there's you're drawing upon something beyond yourself. And I think that is kind of the notion of God. Wow. And how do you realize that this is going on? It happens. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise you, if you went out right now and you started running and you ran for 24 hours and you kept going, you'll get to that same place. Hmm. And I want to go back to this notion that we're obsessed with comfort. Everything we buy, it seems, the sofa, the very comfortable bed, the huge TV, is because we're a culture that's obsessed with feeling comfortable, and we have attached positive sensations to that. But in your book, the, the last one you mentioned, you describe how you shifted this perspective to pain and that you have attached positive sensations to it. And that also you devise this technique to sort of mitigate the pain. Could you expand on that? Yeah, when you think about pain and you think about misery, um, it's it's all in your mind. <laughs> so when you're running and you know you think, oh my my knees hurt or my um, you know my back hurts or my feet hurt. If you really think about that pain, you really pay attention to it. You, it's hard to pinpoint. Like it's it pain is amorphous. Um, the more you focus on it, the more you can't focus on it. And so instead of trying to avoid pain and, you know, instead of um, uh, trying to, to mitigate it, I instead focus on the pain and try to really understand what the pain is all about. I mean, 
you know, right now, if you and I were running together, you might say, oh, I'm in so much pain where I'm not feeling the pain. So that pain is all your perception, right? It's all your neurons. It's all things going on within your mind. And can you change that? You know, why can't you be more like me and not have the pain? And I think it's just really coming down to how you view the pain. You know, can, can you tune into it and can you really try to understand it? And when did you decide that you, when did you decide to shift your perspective? You know, when I ran, I used to, I used to take like uh, anti-inflammatories, like pain mm -hmm. pills, you know, the, to try to uh, mitigate the pain. And I thought, what would it be? I, I wasn't sure it was really helping because it's still, things still hurt. I thought, what would it be like if I just stopped taking these pills and uh, just let my body do its thing? And I started doing that and realizing that I could overcome more pain than I thought. Hmm. And do you think that this focusing on the pain could help people that may be, for example, going through emotional pain? I know that some people feel anxiety right here in the chest. If they focus on that and try to make friends with this pain, do you think it would help? I think that the natural uh, inclination is to um, overcome the pain or somehow get rid of the pain. And I think that trying to get rid of the pain is almost impossible. It just makes the pain worse and you just think about it more. So I think if you instead just turn all your thoughts to the pain and what is causing, really trying to understand what is causing the, the hardship and those feelings, that's a better approach than trying to avoid them or make them go away. Hmm. And what advice would you give to your 20 year old self? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I had a pretty good 20 year old life. Uh, you know, I was a professional windsurfer and, wow. uh, you know, I was, I, I, I was pretty much a very adventurous guy and I was living in California, you know, surfing a lot, um, going to college and really enjoying myself. So when I look back on those days, you know, maybe I should have put more effort into my schoolwork. I don't know, but I don't have many regrets. I really enjoyed my life. I, I really had a good time. I really had some great friends and we were very adventurous. I mean, we were kind of, you know, again, these, you know, this it's kind of cliche now, but you know, we were, we were, we were mountain climbing every weekend. We were, you know, traveling and camping every weekend. We were surfing. We were going to the, you know, beaches around the world. It was a pretty good lifestyle. Wow. That, that's amazing. That's really amazing. And what, what are you planning to do next? What's your next great adventure? Well, I once ran 50 marathons in all of the 50 United States in hmm. 50 consecutive days. And wow. to me, that was just a, it was a great road trip and it was just such grand adventure. So I wanted to do the same thing, but globally to try to run a marathon in every country of the world in a one year time span. But now with, you know, the, the situation that's going on in the world, that's impossible. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I'm going to finish my, uh, I'm working on my next book. So I'm going to finish that. And um, I'm going to start uh, just doing more adventures out your back, out your front door, basically. So telling people how, you know, given the situation, you know, how do you live an adventurous life when you can't, you know, you can't get on a plane and you're kind of confined to your local neighborhood, you know, can you find um, exploration just by running around and just by exploring, you know, what's, what's near and close to you because that's reality we're in right now. And, and how do you find that sense of adventure? You know, it's, to me, it's sometimes getting up at two, like if you wake up at two in the morning and you can't sleep, put on a headlamp and go run around the block. You know, things look different at, at different times of the day and you'll appreciate, uh, you know, those nuances uh, and you'll see things through different eyes. So that's the way I say is, is you know, do things that you typically would never do. Hmm. And I'm going to give you a little hypothetical, okay? If you had a billboard for the whole world to see, What would you put on it? <laughs> <laughs> huh. It's fi it's fine. Take your time. You 
You know, I think I would just say love each other. I think the world, I think now, I mean, although we're facing probably one of the worst moments in human history, it's also one of the most um, profound because I think we're seeing acts of love and kindness uh, amongst individuals and honesty amongst individuals that we haven't seen ever. I mean, you know, I talk to grown men that cry. Uh, they're, they're so concerned about the situation. And for someone to open up like that and to show vulnerability is really a beautiful thing. And I think it's, it's cathartic for all of us. And how do you think people that are having such a horrible time, as you say, can make sense of this situation and hopefully grow after this whole nightmare is over? You know, I think that it'll teach you that you have more resolve than you thought you had and that you're more enterprising than you thought you were. I mean, little things, little connections um, mean so much in ways that we've forgotten. Um, here where I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, in one neighborhood, they just started howling at eight, at eight o'clock at night. They just started howling at the moon as, as a, uh, a way to appreciate the kind of the people that are on the front line and to show them our support. And now, uh, you know, a week later, you go outside at 8 p.m. and it's amazing. Everyone in the community is outside howling. Little kids are outside howling. You know, 80-year-old women are outside howling. Uh, everyone is outside howling. And there's just something that connects us with that that's profound. I mean, it's it's really amazing. So things like that, you know, these little things <laughs> and these unusual things, I think, are, are going to get us through it and make us stronger because of it. Yeah, and definitely now human connection is something that we're missing. And I'm curious to know, like, how do you think the world is going to be afterwards? I feel like we're going to be a lot more grateful. We're going to want that hug, that kiss from uh, our girlfriend or from our mom. I feel like all of that might have been taken for granted before. But now that we're deprived of human connection, it's something that we long for. I don't know if I can state it any better. What you just said was really wonderful. <laughs> you just, <laughs> I think what you said, I believe what you just said. Yeah, that was, that was well, well stated. Thank you, Dean. And is there anything else that you'd like to say? Thank you so much for taking your time. It's been really incredible. Is there anything that you'd like to say or anything specific that you would like to promote? No, I mean, if you want to learn more about me, just, you know, go to Google and just type in my name. <laughs> You know, you can, you can follow me on social media or if you want to read one of my books, you can see my books there. Um, but, you know, I would just say to people that, you know, I've learned a lot through running long distances. And, you know, people say when, you know, when you're running, say you're running 100 miles and you get to mile 60 and you feel like you can't take another step. How do you keep going? What do you think about? And you get into trouble when you start thinking too much. So don't think about where the world is going. Just take it one day at a time. Just get through the day. Be your best self today and then be your best self tomorrow. This, this will pass, but how will it pass? It's just one day at a time. So don't look for the future. Don't, don't try to think about you know, what, how you're going to change things when this is over. Just think about being your best in the current day and the current situation. That's very beautiful, Dean. Very beautiful. Thank you, man. Well, I hope we can run together one day. That would make me really happy. I'll, I'll <laughs> love that. I'll love that. I'm actually going to San Francisco this summer, hopefully, if this all gets cleared up. And I'll love that. If this, that we, we, let's make it a date. If you can get over here, if this all clears up, we will run together. That would be amazing. That would be really amazing. <laughs> not not too you, far, man. like 60 or 70 miles. <laughs> i'll try i'll trade for it i'll trade for it <laughs> wow that's incredible dean and and the one last thing what's your diet like are you vegan or what's it like my diet now is pretty good i i was i didn't always have a healthy diet but now i'm pretty much plant-based uh, i do eat seafood once in a while so i'm kind of a seagan if you will a, you know pescatarian but mostly, mm -hmm. mostly plants, you know, I tell people and mostly raw, like I don't, I don't cook a lot of my food. 
I say mm. that, you know, if I can't dig it from the earth or pick it from a tree, you know, or catch it with my hands or, or with a hook, I, I don't eat it. So pretty healthy diet. Yeah. And, and why have you taken this approach? Um, I've listened to my body. So I just, when I, when I eat a food, I see if it leaves me more energetic or if it leaves me feeling listless. So I just learned that if I eat, you know, if I eat like uh, anything that's processed or anything that's refined, I don't have as much energy. Where if I eat raw food and live food, I'm just so much more energetic and I, have, and I, feel, so much, I feel so much better uh, mentally as well. So I just really tuned into what foods left me feeling better physically and mentally. And I ate more of those. And then foods that left me feeling not so great, I just cut those from my diet. Well, I think that's a great approach and it doesn't get stated enough because everybody says, okay, follow this diet and you'll be great. Follow this diet and you'll be great too. But tuning into your body and seeing what you can um, handle and what you can't, I think that's great. Yeah, I always say listen to everyone, follow no one. So <laughs> gather as much advice as you can and then experiment and find what works best for you. And how do you want to end one amazing quote from you? <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's a quote from my first book that uh, I, I really like. It's um, run when you can, uh, walk if you have to, crawl if you must, just never give up. Amazing, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Thank you for watching this episode of the Rebound Talks podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. We're coming out with episodes every single Wednesday. So please subscribe, leave a like, and if you found anything useful, comment it down below. See you next week.